several years ago when we were studying the uh, book of Revelation uh, before moving back here to Alabama, I had one of the gentlemen in the congregation uh, always having different ideas about what's being talked about. But he told me, he said, God never intended for us to understand the book of Revelation. And he, he read to me from the first part of chapter 1 and verse 3, where John says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And he stopped there and he said, That's all God ever intended. He just intended for you to read or to hear his word, but it never required you to understand it. And I thought that was kind of odd because that verse goes on and says, And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. It's more than just reading God's Word. It's more than just hearing God's Word. God expects us to keep His Word. But to keep His Word, we've got to understand what it means, or else we can never keep it, or else we'd never know that we were keeping God's Word. I love what the Apostle Paul said in regard to this in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, when he says that when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And it's encouraging, at least for me, to know that it's possible by our reading what Paul has written for us, we can have the same understanding that Paul had of God's Word that he had. We can know what Paul knew about it. And so it is possible. We can know. We can understand God's Word. And yet there's so many people in the world today who are saying, no, no, we, we can't understand it. And you don't really need to understand it. But I'd like to tonight just to notice a few things that caused us to not to understand God's Word. And one of the first things that I think about is, is the ignorance we have of God's Word because we don't take time to study it. Uh, that's where the reading comes in, and that's where the idea of coming in, of, of meditating on God's Word to know what it says. But when Paul wrote to the church at Rome, in chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. But they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is how God makes men righteous, what God requires of us in order that we might be right with Him. But these Jews, Paul says, were ignorant of God's righteousness. And because of that, they went about to establish their own righteousness. It's possible that people can be ignorant of what God requires of them in order to be His children and to live the way He wants them to live. But that ignorance is no excuse. Uh, we are responsible for the reading and studying of God's Word and applying it to our life in the proper way that we can know and we can do what God tells us to do. But also understand sometimes that some people are simply ignorant of God's Word. Some people just misunderstand God's Word. And many times it's because of, of conceit that they have. And, and by this I simply mean that sometimes people just have this idea that they know better than God what needs to be done. I've talked about this before. A commercial used to be very popular way back in the 70s, I believe, that Ford Motor Company had. Uh, and it was entitled, Ford Has a Better Idea. And there's some people who feel that way in religion, that they have a better idea of what we need to do and how we should do it than what the Bible teaches us to do. I thought about this this morning when, uh, when our brother Paul Wyndham stood up here and he talked about the Lord's Supper and how that someone had said, you know, we need to get away from this idea of observing the Lord's Supper every Sunday and just do it once a year. Because in doing it every Sunday, they said, we're simply becoming uh, so common to it that, that, that it loses its meaning to us. And I thought, you know, that's not what the Bible says. And this may be another case where somebody feels like, I've got a better idea than what God had for it. And we just need to get away from what God said and start doing it the way that this individual said. And I think the same thing is true sometimes. You see it in people's misunderstanding of the Bible. When, when we study with people, and I've seen this happen several times down in Belize and talking to somebody about, the needs, what we have to do in order to be saved and get to that point about confessing Christ and, and what that means. And I says, what does it mean when it talks about that we're to confess? And they say, well, you, you've got to confess your sins. And I'd say, well, read this verse here for us, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. And they would read that verse and, and they'd say, yeah, we've we got to confess our sins. 
I said, no, look at that verse. What does it say? And I have them read it word for word and then stop them. When did they get to that point where Jesus says, whosoever shall confess me before men? And I thought, what's happened here? That people have been taught so many times that you need to confess your sins in becoming God's child. That that's what they say to know. That's what the Bible teaches. And so when they come to it, they have this preconceived idea. And that's another problem that people have. Uh, we, we prejudge things. Uh, we have our ideas about how things ought to be done. And we just assume that's what the Bible teaches. And when we read our Bible, that's what we see. A long time ago, I saw in a, in a bulletin article, and I've used it before in cases, where someone would have the expression there, uh, a bird in the hand, and then have the expression, Paris in the spring. And you'd read that, and then you'd follow on, and it would say, in all likelihood, you misread those two phrases. Please go back and read them again. And I did. Uh, no, it, that's what it said, a bird in the hand and Paris in the spring. And then it said, unless you're very, very cautious, you still misread that. And I went back to look at those two faces again. And, and what it said was, a bird in thee, the hand, and Paris in thee, the spring. And I had read it, misread it, all three to why? Because I knew what those expressions were. You know, I've heard that all my life, a bird in the hand and Paris in the spring. So I knew what it said before I ever read it. And so when I read it, I read what I thought it said and not what it really said. And sometimes people will do that with the Bible. They come to the Bible with preconceived ideas as to what the Bible is teaching, and even though they read it, and what it says is plain, they see it saying exactly what they were convinced that it said. And so many times there are those misunderstandings that we have because of that, and, and we need to be careful in our lives about things of that nature, that we don't make those type of mistakes and that we don't allow ourselves to be deceived by others. Did you realize that just about, not every, but almost every book in the New Testament warns us about deception and about being deceived? Jesus talked about that to his disciples again and again, and he would say to them, you know, beware, and, you know, that no man deceives you. And so many times you're reading the Bible where people are being deceived. And if we're not careful, we allow ourselves to be deceived as to what the Bible is teaching. We need to refrain from elevating our opinion or any man's opinion above what the Word of God says. I like this expression that I saw one time. Somebody says that faith is based upon evidence. Opinion is a human guess. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Opinion comes from human imagination. And so instead of listening to what people give to us about opinions, we need to go back to the Word of God again and again and read and know what it says. And Paul said when you read what he's written, you can understand what he knows about the mystery of Christ. We can have the same knowledge that Paul had. And we can know and read that the Bible requires of us to become the children of God. Do we have to believe in Jesus? And I've never met anyone who says, no, 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 you don't need to believe in Christ. Everybody understands and accepts that. But then when you see that the Bible requires repentance, and yes, most everybody I know anything about understands that the Bible requires repentance. We need to make that change in our life, to get away from sin and start living for God the way we should. But then when you get to the idea of confession, sometimes people have in the hard problems we talked about. Some people want to confess their sins and not realizing what they need to do is to confess Jesus. The word confession, in the Greek homo legeo, simply means to say the same thing. When Jesus was baptized, God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. If we're going to confess Christ, if we're going to say the same thing, that's what we've got to confess, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we've got to allow ourselves to be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And that's made plain. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16 that that's what we need to do. Don't let anyone deceive you in regard to what the Bible says. Don't come to it with preconceived ideas or notions, but read that book for yourself and know what it is that God is teaching. And then submit yourself in obedience to His will. So this afternoon, if there's anyone present here who, who's never really done what the Bible tells us in becoming His children, or, or if you've done that, but you know you haven't been living for God the way you should, then go back to the Bible and see what God requires of that erring child of His.
that we need to do what Peter told Simon to do, and that was to repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So we repent of our sins when we're erring Christians, and we pray to God for the forgiveness we need. Whatever might be your need, now, if you're subject in any way to the invitation of Christ, we pray that you will respond in obedience to his will, and do that now while we stand and sing.